изменилось в конце. Vandaag zou oorspronkelijk de 2X-volk zijn, degene die stopgezet is. Het was vandaag, dus ik denk dat het vandaag een thema had. Ja, basic questions if you you can if you want to participate you can go here with your mobile uh, enter this code and then you can participate um, there, there's also a Wi-Fi if you need it that's a lab or a lab 5g and the word the password is connected in a lab uh, all lower caps Connected in a lab. Connected in love. So yeah, the first question I usually like to ask is, do you own Bitcoin? Just to see how the audience is composed.
next question. Do you use Bitcoin? Slightly different. <clears throat> Good. Many people hold it, don't use it. Interested in this one. How would you rate personally your blockchain knowledge? Nothing, a bit, a lot, or I'm Satoshi. Don't need to disclose your identity. Okay. Six, six, a bit. That's good. At least uh, I don't need to start completely from scratch. I'm wondering about this question. The true innovation of blockchain technology is immutability, censorship resistance, transparency, privacy, freedom of action, or crowdfunding. What would you say? With six people uh, who, are, who are consistently uh, giving answers, so let's see. Sorry, what was the password again? Or somewhere? Connected in A lab. Sorry? Connected in A lab. Yeah. Okay. Nicely distributed. I am, there are a few questions later, but I'm not going into those yet. Because first, one of the reasons why I asked the last question is they also have to do with your vision of Bitcoin. And there has been a lot of uh, uh, dispute in the last years over what is Bitcoin? I'm talking specifically about Bitcoin now, not all the other blockchains. Um, but they do, uh, they will, fa they have faced or will face the same kind of thing. Once a community grows, the project changes, and you will have people with different visions on where it should go. It starts out with a really short, uh, small core group who usually share the idea, but once it grows to a certain critical mass, you get different ideas. Um, first question before I go into this more uh, deep question, does anybody, uh, anybody has no idea how a blockchain works? Really no clue. That's good. So if I say that a blockchain... Come in, please. So uh, if I say that a blockchain exists only one way in time that is not news. So it only goes forward, it can't go backwards. That is not news to people. Good. Because that's important. What we saw over the last uh, few months are a few different visions on what specifically the Bitcoin project should, or is, should be or is. Um, and that has led to so-called forks. And the reason why I'm covering the, pro, the, uh, the topic at this point is I'm getting a lot of questions about people uh, from people who have no idea how a fork actually works or why a fork works the way uh, it does and what it, how it affects you. So um, I thought I'd do a small topic about the different kind of forks that we get. So before um, 1st of August this year, we only had one version of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain. After the, one, the 1st of August, we got Bitcoin Cash. A few weeks ago, we got Bitcoin Gold, which is uh, a form of Bitcoin, the SegWit version of Bitcoin that purportedly can be mined, not with ASICs, not with huge data centers, but now can be mined with GPUs again, video cards, video chips. 
Um, and since this week there is a kind of a forking mania because I already saw that there are three, four other uh, probably bogus projects which are also going to fork. There's one called Super Bitcoin. There's one just which just forked uh, Bitcoin Cash because they didn't agree with Bitcoin Cash or because they're just trolling. Um, but all these things create, like you said earlier, they create new coins because basically they're copying the ledger. They're copying also the history of, of Bitcoin. Not only uh, they create a new blockchain, they also create the history. So if you have 100 Bitcoins at the 1st of August, you also would get 100 Bitcoin cash. And if, you hold, uh, if you held that, you'd also get 100 Bitcoin gold. That's quite a new thing. We haven't seen that before. We have seen a lot of copies of uh, blockchain code, but not of the Bitcoin blockchain in this way. So, this is the central question. According to me, who is in charge? Because if there is one person in charge, it's fairly easy, you wouldn't have any fork. And we see that with quite a lot of other blockchain projects. I myself have been involved with the NXC project for a long time. Um, and there's a small group of developers there, three or four, and they create new code. Sometimes the, we even hard forked. So we created a, a so-called hard fork, which I'm going to explain later. But everybody followed because they were the only ones developing. So then you have no problem because the software just upgrades. A fork is basically whatever kind of fork uh, on consensus that you have. It's a change. Hello. It's a change in the software that the community and, and the network can either accept or reject. So who is in charge is quite a central question which we'll uh, get to later because that has to do with blockchain governance, also a topic that, uh, that is hotly debated over the last uh, weeks. This is the governance structure of Bitcoin. And there are four groups, basically four groups, you can argue that there are more, but you, can, you could uh, divide them in the group of developers. Developers create code. That's their definition. Miners, and we're talking about miners not as computers, because that's the difference. You have miners as people, as entrepreneurs, people who make money, and you have miners as a function within the network, which is actually doing the proof of work and creating new blocks on the system. So we need you frequently you see a lot of confusion when, for instance, if you go onto Twitter or Reddit, people talk about miners, but sometimes they talk about the computer function, the network function, sometimes they talk about people. Here we're talking about <coughs> people. We have investors, of course, people who put money into the network, give it value by putting in fiat money or services. And you have nodes, which is kind of gen generic. Nodes are usually run by businesses who need access to a full blockchain. So they are, uh, and nodes are also fully validating. So they keep a copy of everything. Um, when we use normal wallets, Bitcoin wallets, we usually do not use full nodes anymore because the full blockchain of Bitcoin is about 150, I think 150, 60 gigabytes. You wouldn't be able to store it on your mobile or you need a, a damn big uh, SD card. It takes a long time. So most of the people who usually use so-called simplified payment verification wallets, which don't download the full blockchain, but get their information from somewhere else. That's a trust issue because that means you need to trust the source of the, of the block information that you're getting. And, as, and uh, uh, an SPV wallet cannot check whether it's true or not. A full wallet can. So we have these four groups and they work with and against each other. So a simplified thing that happens is developers make code, miners and all the other users need to run code. So if nobody runs it, they can 
create code, however, uh, as many code as they want. If it isn't run, they're powerless. They cannot force somebody to run code. You have miners, miners validate the blockchain. So they validate transactions, they put them in blocks and they gain the right to create blocks and make the blockchain longer. So they are a uh, vital part for making sure that, for instance, nodes and investors actually get the transactions confirmed. So they're needed. Investors are needed to fund, let's say, almost everything. If there weren't any investors in the system, people would put in money and hold it, these probably would be out of cash. Miners gain a certain amount of Bitcoin by each block they create, 12 and a half Bitcoin. But those 12 and a half Bitcoin, if they weren't uh, valued at any point, they would be spending a lot of energy, a lot of cash on energy, and they wouldn't be able to pay their costs. So they're actually dependent on these two. The businesses itself and other stakeholders, so these nodes are also meant customers in these, um, are also dependent on the value, they're dependent on the miners, and they're dependent on the developers for creating good code. So it's an inter, uh, interconnection, and none of these could be argued are really in charge. At least that's the theory. The theory is that they keep each other in balance. So if the developers push code, they create code that these two want, but they don't, the miners don't want, then you could say miners could refuse to run the code. Well, fine. But they will be running software that nobody wants to use. So the theory behind this is, is that customers will run away, go to the miners that actually will run their code. So the miners who are running on uh, the wrong chain or running the, the wrong software, there's no good, good or wrong by the way, but the software that these two groups don't want will be left out and they will be out of pocket, will lose money and they will either be forced to quit or they will be forced to switch. The same of course with developers, they can create any kind of thing that they like in theory, but if they create things that nobody wants or really oppose none of these will be running it and the chances are that an outside development team comes in and takes over development which is basically what's happening now with the fracturing of the bitcoin community you see a group of develop a new group of developers who says we need we think there is a need for bigger blocks we think that this is our opinion there is another group that says, no, there's a different solution, and it's actually not a solution that we think is, is secure. And you get these competitions. You get a group of miners that does agree with bigger blocks. You do get a group of, of nodes or uh, users who do, do agree with this, and a group of investors that do ag agree with this. And hence, you get two different systems once you fork. If both are viable, if both are economically viable, both will survive. It's as simple as that. There is not something good or bad in this. This is the theory of, block, of open source software. Hey, hi. So if you have a product that's actually wanted by the market, the market will sustain it. So there is green arrows running software, refusing software. It pushes against each other. So, a brief overview of this word fork, because forks are used, the word fork is used interchangeably and it's really confusing sometimes because people do not define what type of fork they're talking about and there is a huge difference. So this is a small map that I've created. This is the Bitcoin blockchain, or any blockchain, but let's use the Bitcoin one because it's used um, as a template for a lot of others. So this, let's say, this is the start. This is in 2009. 2009, so eight years back, Bitcoin was launched and 
from the start there were already people who couldn't do on this blockchain what they wanted to do. Uh, if you look back in history you see that there were quite a lot of people asking could we do this, could we do that, and most of the things either they were included really early or they were told either you need to wait or it won't happen at any time because we think it's mostly it's not secure. Um, what they did at that point was not fork the Bitcoin blockchain. That, that didn't happen. What did happen from 2011 to at least 2014 was that people forked the code. So you took the code of Bitcoin and you tweaked it. So Litecoin is, is one of the, the most well-known. They took, the, they took Bitcoin code, the full code, and they changed certain parameters. So uh, Charlie Lee, the creator of Litecoin, wanted a system where he said, if Bitcoin is gold, then we also need a kind of silver in the crypto. Uh, because you don't spend gold. You, never sp uh, you don't spend a thousand euros as a bill in the shop, you, you spend euros and 10 euros and 20 euros. We need smaller denominations, plus we need it to be quicker because I'm not going to wait six confirmations in a shop before my transaction is safe. That's an hour in Bitcoin time, six confirmations. So they created on the Bitcoin code, they created uh, a faster blockchain, they have block times of 2 minutes instead of 10 and they created more coins on the system so it would be cheaper so that's, let's say for Litecoin it's 5 times, it's 100, I think 100 million uh, did more than 100 million, no 96, sorry, 96 so, um, but that is called a code based fork so it's just a code, they didn't copy the history, nobody got when they held 10 bitcoins, they didn't get 10 litecoins, they started with mining. Because the thing that they also changed was the mining algorithm in which, in which blocks were made. So this was easier, again you could create them easier on your own uh, computer. And also they wouldn't be outcompeted by the larger miners. That was also a problem that they already saw in 2000. So a lot of changes and they did it in a new blockchain. This is called a code-based fork. And a lot of people are already talking, older people are confusing these with Bitcoin forks. So Bitcoin, of course, also has a few times a week normal forks because sometimes you get this kind of situation. You get two blocks that are created at exactly the same time. And Bitcoin uh, and blockchains are set up in such a way that you cannot determine which one is the correct one. Because there is no correct in a blockchain. You just deal with the information that's given to you. When is it determined that a block is valid? We have a rule in Bitcoin that the longest chain with the most work in it is the true chain. That's a network rule. So you get this situation that this happens for a while. You have two chains that are both equally long and both are Bitcoin. But once one chain gets a new block, that's the longest chain and that's the true chain. And this block is gone. That's just all the transactions in there are gone back into the system again. If they're already in these two blocks, not a problem, you're still confirmed. If they're not in there, they go back into the, the so-called mempool, the memory pool, where all the unconfirmed transactions are in, no problem. This happens several times a week. This is called a stale block because the block is gone again. It's a normal fork. Completely innocent. These two <coughs> have been talked about a lot in the last year, soft forks and hard forks. So we had SegWit, which is a new, uh, a new functionality <coughs> to the Bitcoin blockchain, was implemented as a soft fork and Bitcoin Cash was a hard fork. So what is the difference? We already had these two. 
These are called consensus forks because they actually are uh, crucial to how a transaction is accepted or rejected by the blockchain. And if a transaction is rejected in one chain but not in another chain, that's called a hard fork. If it's not rejected and everybody can still use the same transactions, it's a soft fork. So you can boil it down to a soft fork makes the consensus rules stricter. So if we do it for block, uh, block size, for instance, uh, now the block size of Bitcoin is one megabyte. It's not really size anymore since blockchain, since SegWit, but let's forget that for a while. It used to be one megabyte. So if the rules would get stricter, for instance, the new rules are half a megabyte. New software, half a megabyte. All the other, the older software would still, which would still accept half a megabyte blocks because it's not larger than one megabyte. The rule gets stricter. They see a half megabyte block come in and say, yeah, fine, I can accept this because it's within my rules. So once it's more strict, and the new software won't accept one megabyte blocks, so it won't accept one megabyte blocks by the old software, but that's old software, so fine. Oh, the, the people who do not upgrade have no problem in a soft fork. So if you are on 1.14, the others are on 1.15, there's no problem with you getting behind or left out of the rules. But what happens now in a hard fork, so what happens in Bitcoin Cash, one megabyte, and the new software says eight megabytes is the new rule. So somebody is on the new software and they create a block two megabytes large and somebody is still on the old software. They won't be able to participate in the network because they don't accept two megabyte blocks. So they're out, they lose out on the system. So the hard fork forces people to upgrade it forces them. If you don't, you're out of the system and you're out of everything. You can't, you can't participate anymore. A soft fork allows all the software to either slowly upgrade because eventually they will have to upgrade because they're also missing out on other features. But it doesn't force them in a way a hard fork does. It keeps the chain together. And that is a philosophical difference within the groups too. Some people say a hard fork makes for a very clear choice. Either you follow or you don't. The other says it's a dictatorship because you're forcing people to do something or else you lose your value. That's basically the discussion. But that's what happened in the last year. So we, here you see it when a hard fork occurs, and this is Bitcoin Cash in this case, it runs parallel with the others, but it can't transact on this fork anymore. And a soft fork usually just does this. This is where the old rule ends. We're moving a bit to the side, but everybody can still be included in the whole system. Of course, within the other systems, you get exactly the same. So Litecoin has already hard forked too in the past. Some people disagreed there, so they created FTC for instance, which is Feathercoin, was a small change in the code, but still on the same chain. This takes the history with it, as you can see. It's built on this, so here you have the same, and here this takes the history of Litecoin with it. Um, that's the difference. So here, you start with nothing. Here, you get the situation, 100 bitcoins gives you, in the history, the same amount on the new chain. That's why you get 100 bitcoin cash for free, basically. It's also one of the reasons that the price of bitcoin rose just before the forks, because people were hoarding bitcoins to get bitcoin cash. It's a good price driver. So, today would have been the day where SegWit 2x would get its 2x. What was 2x? We had SegWit, that's let's say a soft fork. 
and they included in that agreement a 2x and the 2x was going from 1 megabyte blocks to 2 megabyte blocks. That would have been again a hard fork. SegWit itself is a soft fork. That didn't happen and the reason why it didn't happen, does anybody know? Does it, did anybody follow it? Yeah. Not enough consensus. Not enough consensus. And, and what was the reason there wasn't consensus, do you think? Um, well, a lot of people didn't like Core. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but Core want, didn't want uh, 2x. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty about it. Right? I'm yeah. not in a position to sort of give yeah. the, the, an answer. The main reason boils back to this question. Who is in charge? What happened was 2x was created by 8 or 9 or 10 companies who said this is the way we go forward, you can follow or you can, can't follow. That's up to you, but you are confronted with a hard fork if you don't follow. You're left behind on the legacy chain, the old chain. The reason why most people didn't like it was not because there is anything against going from one to two megabytes, although SegWit itself was already a kind of an upgrade of the, the, the size of transactions, but it, it, that's a debatable one. There is not necessarily something wrong with an upgrade. What most people uh, uh, dis were disappointed with and said this creates an incentive which is a, a, a situation which is really bad if, if one group takes it over and then forces the rest of them to fall. Bitcoin and blockchains are about opting in, having the choice to follow or not to follow. In this case you had eight companies who said we represent 80% of everyone, we represent them and that's why we have the power to decide this for everyone. That's the main reason why it was rejected. And in the end last week they just said, again, these eight groups said, it's called off. It's not as if any community member actively could have pulled a switch in there. This was just eight companies deciding we are not doing it. Probably because this would eat into their profits anyway. So, again, this is one side. This is the side from the original Bitcoin group. There is also, of course, the Bitcoin Cash group who has a different story. And this is where it gets a bit iffy because now you have two groups calling themselves Bitcoin and who was the real one. And they have different visions on what it is supposed to be. And I'm not going to give answers here because I'm, I like being in the middle in this one. Uh, but I'm going to show you two pictures of reality. And they're both true from a certain position. And it shows you also why it's difficult to talk about these things before you end up in a shouting match. Because this is the vision of Bitcoin Cash. This is what happened. So we have the original Bitcoin, which is yellow, the original. And this was where SegWit, the soft fork happened, so it became purple. It changed into something else. And then we got the hard fork from Bitcoin Cash. And the original Bitcoin was restored. The original vision from Satoshi Nakamoto. That's their claim. And on the other hand, we have the SegWit chain, which is not Bitcoin, according to Bitcoin Cash. It's SegWit coin. So all the other forks that we see now, Bitcoin Gold, is SegWit Gold. That's not Bitcoin, it's SegWit Gold. We have SegWit Chain, and here we would have SegWit 2x, which was a good name according to them, would be not Bitcoin. This is the vision from their side. They are convinced that they are following the true vision, and the true vision according to them is that it needs to be a payment system. Everybody needs to be able to pay with also small transactions with Bitcoin. That's how it was meant. And the reason why they say that is it's called a peer-to-peer -peer cash system in the white paper. Vision one. 
This is the vision of Bitcoin core people, usually. We have the Bitcoin chain, that's still running. What happened was we had the Bitcoin cash chain, we had it's fallen off the picture here. This is Bitcoin Cash, and then we got a split, another fork, which is called Bitcoin Gold. It's all not Bitcoin, by the way. And the Segway 2X chain, which didn't happen today, we are here. And that would also be a fork. But the original Bitcoin is the one created by Bitcoin Core. That's their vision. This is a big fight, if you think like that. If, you, if your position is that this chain, and your position is your, you are the original Bitcoin, that's a difficult position to maintain. So why, the, why this gets really confusing is, we have a technical definition of a fork, but this is not enough. We also have a social definition of a fork, and anybody can say we are Bitcoin basically, and who's right? The difference in opinion here is that the SegWit, the, the, the Bitcoin core group, is going to use Bitcoin as a kind of a settlement layer, which can be slow, which isn't meant for small transactions. They're building a second layer on top of it called Lightning Network, where the, where the small and fast transactions are done. It's a completely different vision on where it could go. Again, I'm not taking the position here, you're perfectly allowed to do anything and think anything. But who decides what Bitcoin is? And I have a little thought experiment about that because a lot of people said that uh, it was the miners that decide this. Miners vote for what Bitcoin is. So, um, my thought experiment about this was more like the real function of Bitcoin <coughs> is to, to avoid a double spend, to make sure that the history is immutable and trustworthy. That's it. That's what Bitcoin is supposed to do. So, a 51% attack, which is the classic attack against the blockchain, where a majority of mining power is in the hands of, of a malicious actor, somebody who wants to attack the, the blockchain, and usually attack takes the form in trying to do a double spend. So, we have history here, we have a few blocks. These are nicely mined. And then somebody tries to do an attack and he does have 51% or more of hashing power. So it changes something here. So we get a new history. Technically a fork, because the history has changed. You have one group mining on this one. This is the original history. This, oh no, the change is made here. So this block is affected. Somebody changes something here, makes a new block, and creates a new blockchain. And what the Bitcoin network demands is this. One needs to be longer. That's the true Bitcoin. That's the ledger we follow. So what if 51% wins? Which one is Bitcoin? Which one is the real ledger? Technically, this is, the, this is the correct ledger. Would we accept it? We know that some, we, everybody can see this. Eh? It's a transparent ledger. Everybody can see that somebody cheated here. Would people accept it? As the true one? Probably not, is my contention. Because we know somebody changed it in their favor, and therefore it's not a trustworthy ledger anymore. So, miners, but this is done by miners. Miners mined it, 51% or more. So if we go by the idea that miners decide, this false ledger is the correct ledger. I don't think that works that way. So who decides? 
There's no developer involved in this one. This is just consensus. Who decides in the end which is the correct one? Most people will probably just say, we're not even looking at this one anymore. We're, only, we're going to go by software that actively says we're only following this one because the other one is not trustworthy. And who makes the choice? Users. People who use it. You don't want to have a correct ledger. The end power in Bitcoin, end power, usually it's a mix of course because we follow developers and we follow majority hashing control. But during an attack, users decide. We in say. The end, users are very uh, easy to influence. If there's a good marketing campaign of the bottom one, they will win. That's a different story. But it is the users you need to influence. You don't need to influence the mind. The decision yeah. power, because this, this model still says that the decision power is with the user. So you need to influence the user. Marketing works, definitely. You can, if you can make a good story around we needed to create this false transaction and then make some story around it and make that really convincing, that might work. But not by, with all users, so you get the discussions again. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's true. That's, yeah. Well, you, you ask if it's the nodes or the people who use Bitcoin. The nodes are run by people who use Bitcoin. They don't, uh, they don't appear out of nowhere. So the point is, it's, there is an element of human action in here. If we follow blindly, if we just say, these are the technological rules, fine, we're doing this, that one, that's the longest one, I can feel it. People don't do that, and Bitcoin doesn't expect it. It does expect that people are aware of what's happening. But yeah, in the end, of course, it's the software that does it. It's not, uh, it's not the people themselves that go in and change things. But it's the choice by the people who run the software. So in the end, it comes down on you decide which software you run. And that's where the forking, the, the whole forking discussion. So, of course, usually day to day, Bitcoin is run by the software, by developers, mined by miners, from which we assume that all of these miners are honest. However, and this is where we are now, once you see that there is what you could call an attack, Sometimes, look, these, these forks are also called sometimes attacks, and that's subjective. Because you, that's, again, depending on where you are in this one. In this one it's not an attack, in this one it's definitely an attack. So that depends on your reality. But in the end it's the users who need to make the choice. If everybody said, we're doing nothing with Bitcoin Cash, for instance, it would die immediately. Apparently, they have enough people who do use it. Yeah. What do you mean by user then? Is it somebody who's using a wallet or an exchange? Or a is business? He, sure he doesn't make a change. He doesn't make uh, a decision about which miner. He can. That's the thing. Usually, you don't. If you just use your software, just use the wallet on your phone, then you don't make the well. Then you make the choice not to choose. It's the same with using uh, an exchange to keep your Bitcoin, yeah. which means you don't own your Bitcoin. You give away the responsibility for a feeling of safety, which is fine, that's a choice. But you can run a full node, that's a choice, and you're allowed to make it, that's the nice thing. Bitcoin and, and, and true blockchains, as I call them, so that's blockchains that give you the power to do things, are completely opt-in. You can choose to use them in this way. You can also say, I don't care. I'm fine with the developers or this group of developers deciding for me. As long as you know that you're giving away that responsibility, fine, it's your choice. So this is quarter to seven. No, okay, yeah, this is your Okay, so that's basically, 
my point, in the end, the decision lies with the users. During day-to-day, -day, it's usually developers and miners. I grant you that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>